Today on Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat, Two Rivers Boat Works takes on repairing and customizing a 36-foot yellow fin. I think he's going to get a lot of comments when he goes over to the Bahamas or spends a day at the sand bar with his boat. George Labonte meets with the owner of a beautifully restored 261 Mako. Now this isn't the first project Chad has taken on, but ultimately it seems like this is going to be the boat for him, exactly what he wanted. Wildfire Marine begins final rigging on the 25-foot Mako project. We're trying to meet this deadline, but certain things are kind of pushing it further and further away. So uh, we're going to keep going and see what we can get done. And L&H begins restoration work on one of their own, a classic 33-foot walk around. It's an older 1995, built back in the beginning, early days of the company, hull number five. All coming up on Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us as we follow one-off builds to all-out restorations in Stewart, Florida's Dreamboat District, home to some of the best custom boat builders in the world. From modest to over-the-top, industry experts from the district's premier facilities show how it's done. Fiberglass repair, custom paintwork, engine rigging, electronics installations, and more. And boating editor George Labonte shares the stories of boaters who have already turned their dreams into reality. This is Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. So over at Two Rivers Boatworks, we had a customer get hold of us. He has a 36 yellow fin that needs a bit of work done to it. And he's got some fuel tank issues with the boat. They've also had a problem with the transom on this boat. When they throttle up, there's a, there's a cracking sound coming from the transom. And we actually found that on top of the two stringers, there was a whole lot of mugget, cavasol and resin or something mixed. And that had, that had cracked. And our guess is that's probably where that cracking sound was coming from. We were able to chip all of that out. We now rebuilding the top of the stringers because it's, we're taking the well out. So it's going to be flush. So we need to rebuild those stringers up to where the new deck's going to go over. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, beef it up with carbon fiber, probably be able to hang anything off this boat when we finished. Got the leaning post off, then started the tedious job of cutting the deck up so we could get to the fuel tanks. Used a lot of muscle, a bit of ingenuity, but we were able to get them out. The company who makes the fuel tanks for us, they are making the new fuel tanks for the Yellowfin 36. They went in really easy. The guys did a great job putting the deck back on. When it came to the inside of the boat, the more we worked on it, the more we realized that it was just not up to scratch. And I, I just felt that it needed to be done properly. We basically started with a, a clean canvas. Uh, we resprayed the whole inside of this boat. We then did the non-slip. He's decided to um, paint the bottom of the boat. He wanted it to match his Yeti coolers. So we had the color matched to his Yeti cooler. We did a few repairs. We fared it out. We, we painted it. And I'm very impressed with the way it, with, the way it came out. Um, I think it's, it's kind of unique. Um, I've seen a lot of boats with a seafoam sides and a white bottom, but to actually see a boat with a seafoam bottom and the white sides, I'm really impressed by the way it's come out. The boat's looking fantastic. To me, nothing says custom quite like, you know, custom painted cowlings. Larry, who does my painting, is pretty creative, and he put down his own pattern. I have to admit, it came out really, really good. Um, I love the way those motors look. The, the sea foam against the white, it, it really, really looks good. And then, of course, there's always those other little custom touches that we've done, you know, like around the bottom of the, the leaning post and the bottom of the kill box, we've, we've brought the sea foam green in to match the bottom of the boat. I think he's going to get a lot of comments when he goes over to the Bahamas or spends a day at the sand bar with his boat. When we return, FS Boating Editor George Labonte joins dream boat owner Chad Meffel aboard his beautifully restored 26-foot Mako in this week's One Man's Dream Boat segment. This segment brought to you by Fiberglass Coatings, the largest selection of fiberglass materials in the United States. 
FGCI is a leading supplier of composite materials, family owned for over 60 years and headquartered right here in Florida. We have the materials and technical expertise to service manufacturers, repair professionals, and DIYers alike. Our gel coat color matching is a favorite of seasoned professionals and weekend warriors. Access our online store at FGCI.com, call to speak with a product specialist, or visit our stores in Fort Lauderdale or St. Petersburg. FGCI is your partner on boat projects big and small. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join us for this week's One Man's Dreamboat segment with Florida Sportsman Boating Editor George Labonte as we feature anglers who have already launched their dream. Florida Sportsman began these features 30 years ago and the dreams just keep getting better. Today we meet up with Chad Meffam in Sebastian, Florida. Chad's the owner of a Mako 261 which is fully restored now this isn't the first project Chad has taken on, but ultimately it seems like this is going to be the boat for him, exactly what he wanted. Seen a 261 one day online and kind of liked it, liked the lines of it, liked the looks of it. Did a little searching, found one or two of them that just didn't work out and um, wound up buying a 22 Century and I ran that for a little while and wanted to venture on out further offshore. I just needed a little bigger boat. And so I started looking again and wound up finding another 261 down in the Keys. Uh, went down there and it wound up being an all original uh, 1989 261. Instead of diving right into this project, Chad decided to run it for a summer and get a better feel for what exactly modifications he was going to need to do to make it his own. Well, after I got a chance to run the boat a little bit throughout the summer, uh, I do a lot of bottom fishing and stuff like that. So I kind of figured out a few things that I wanted to change. Uh, so then I attacked the transom, went ahead and closed the transom in, um, made it a little higher and uh, put a lot of in there. I definitely safened up the boat by, uh, by closing the transom, you know, less water over the back. And it's a lot safer, you know, and, and I've got a six-year-old daughter that loves to go out, out with me. And uh, yeah, it's all about safety when she's coming out with us. After I, uh, after I closed in the transom, um, I got looking around and uh, decided, you know, uh, on a bracket. So I went with Armstrong. So I went with one of their extra flotation brackets and put it on there. Uh, it's a 30 inch setback. And uh, it just makes a night and day difference of the whole boat, the way it runs and accessibility in and out as you're diving or snorkeling or just even swimming around. As I was started my project on the Mako, I was probably three or four months into it, and a guy came along and just had to have my Sentry that I was running for a backup boat. So as um, soon as I wound up selling that, you know, I realized, man, my deadline just got a lot tighter on this build. Uh, we had a keys, uh, keys trip planned, and it was coming quick. Now that Chad's older boat is out of the picture, he's got a real deadline facing him. He's got to get this boat done. I wound up taking the console up, and uh, did away with the teak trim below the console, glass the console to the floor. Um, we wound up pulling the fuel tank before we did all of that and uh, went through and pulled the fuel tank, had a new one built and stuck in there. Uh, all new lines, all new hoses, and um, glass the console back down for a nice sturdy uh, solid console. And then uh, wound up moving to the electronic part of it. Um, I do marine electronics, so as I'm you know, in and out of all different types of boats, I kind of got an idea of what I wanted for the boat. I started fresh, pulled all the old wire out, pulled all the new wire in um, to all the bilge pumps, all the lights, all the underwater lights and everything. I went with a, um, an acrylic panel for the console itself, and I overlaid two 12-inch garments in the acrylic panels. Um, squeezed in uh, the pilot, autopilot, Garmin autopilot, and Fusion Stereo. Went with JL Audios for all the speakers and amps. I love music everywhere I go. I, you know, I've got music going. And the T-Top, uh, T-Top's a little oversized, and it's a little bigger than the original one that was on there. Uh, gives us a little, little extra shade while we're offshore, you know, hot sunny days in Florida, you know, it gets brutal out there. So a little extra, uh, little extra canvas over top of you, never hurt anything. I knew the, the original 200s was just on their last leg. So I got searching around and I found a really good deal on a set of uh, 225 Yamaha four strokes. They're very fuel efficient, uh, pretty strong motors, really quiet, 
and you don't have the exhaust smell of you know, the typical two strokes. With all the help that I had, we made our deadline. I mean, it was it was a very fast build. You know, um, you know I think we got it done in, in five to six months, which is you know, pretty fast for you know, a project like that. Uh, you know, there was always there was a couple times that you know we run into little hiccups and all, and, and created late night working on the boat. You know, just to just kind of get it done for our original deadline. Now that Chad's Mako project was completed, it seems like this is definitely going to be the last build for him for a while. This is my dream boat. Um, I actually have done a few of them in the past, um, but that was never, I, it was never the right boat. When I started this boat, I, I kind of had to promise my wife that this was going to be the last boat. This was going to be the last project. Uh, I feel like it's always going to be a project because, you know, you always want to change things. But. Uh, it is the boat that I wanted. It is, it is a very safe, very reliable boat, and uh, I plan on having it for many moons to come. After an initial investment of $5,000 and spending $35,000 on repairs and custom modifications, the cost of Chad's dream boat comes to a total of $40,000. When we return, Wildfire Marine begins final rigging on the 25-foot Mako project. This segment brought to you by Pacer Group, marine-grade electrical wire, components, and systems. For more than 30 years, Pacer Group has been the most trusted provider of wire, cable, and electrical products to the top marine manufacturers. All of our wire and cable is made in the USA to ensure it's the best in the industry. Pacer Group provides the highest quality electrical products to be found at one place. You can order with us at pacergroup.net. Shop online and ship or pick up your web order within an hour at our Hollywood, Florida location. Welcome back to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join the team at Wildfire Marine as they install brand new trim tabs and rub rail on the 25-foot Mako project. Again, we're on uh, Brian's 25 Mako. Uh, things are coming along good. Everything's painted, the bracket's on. Uh, most of the interior work is done. Uh, one of the things we're gonna do is put, uh, Brian wanted was trim tabs. Uh, kind of surprising to see a boat this old without them by now. Uh, this has such a deep V that, uh, you know, once you get a couple of people on a boat, if somebody walks one side or the other, the boat usually lifts without the tabs, so. Um, we ordered a set of the bolt uh, trim tabs. Uh, and with the fact that we have this bracket, we went ahead and ordered the bolts with the trailing edge, which has a very low mounting point. Uh, we did run into a problem though. The dead rise had two different planes on it uh, in, in the extent to where the tab was gonna ride. So I went ahead and called Bennett to see what they thought about installing. And uh, they recommended we push the bracket, the tabs in as far as we could until we reached the notch on the lift straight. Uh, when we go ahead and find a location of our, uh, where we're gonna mount the tabs, they want you to keep the, lead, the leading edge of the tab has to be about a quarter inch up from the bottom of the hull. And the trailing edge, depending on how long your tab is, they want three quarters of an inch at the trailing edge. So the easiest way I found to do that is take this piece of wood, put a boat stand underneath the boat, tie it up against the hull. Now I can go ahead and put a piece of quarter inch plywood up against the transom, set the bracket on it, and then put a three quarter inch piece at the trailing edge of the, of the uh, tab and let it rest on there, and that gives me all the dimensions that I need to have. We go ahead and we drill our pilot holes for the tab itself, then mark all the holes, drill them all out, put sealant on everything, go ahead and run the screws in on the tab. Then we find a location for the height of the, uh, the trim tab hinge, and by doing that, we have our block set up so that we're at the proper height. We go ahead and we mark it. I drill a couple of pilot holes again. Uh, I'll take the template that they gave us, set them at the pilot hole, and drill the remaining holes for it. Then we go ahead and seal it, go ahead and run our wire through the, through the transom, and then we move up to the inside of the boat where we go and do the uh, installation for the, the trim tab indicator. I turn most of that job over to my wife, Debbie. She's, a, she's our wiring specialist here. She doesn't like to drill holes, so I'll go ahead and drill the holes in the dashboard for it. And then, uh, then she'll take it from there and get the boat all wired up. He, he, he cuts the holes in the boat, I don't. So once the wire came through, I put the plug on there, and then I took their extension, and I have a, a pull string that will go through the tube up into the console. I plugged it in, 
I pulled the wires up through, and then uh, I plugged everything in, and everything worked fantastic. As usual, with most of these boats, when we close in a transom, you have to fill in the rub rail section in between the, the old rub rail. Uh, Taco made a, a, a white rub rail that, that fit his description, so we went ahead and ordered that up. The main part of the rub rail is a, is a rigid vinyl rub rail that comes in 20-foot sections. We went ahead and, and took some measurements and then went ahead and started what we normally do. On one side, we left enough to go back to this, to fold back to the center, and that gave us a, a layout where we had our joints that were, that were very far away from each other, so there was nothing to detract from the, from the rub rail itself. Wrapping the corner, it's always a little bit of a challenge. Uh, this boat was a little more so because it is basically almost square corners. So we heated it and cut out this piece of starboard that fit the gap inside the center of the rub rail. Uh, this allowed me to, to heat it up enough to wrap it nice and tight and not lose its shape. Then we had to go back and, and heat the, the top and bottom edge just to shape them so that they, they fit in tighter to the hull and got rid of the buckle. And then because it's a rigid rub rail, it, it carries itself pretty well. So we'll go ahead and go about five or six feet and put another screw in and then go another five or six feet. And we kind of let the boat determine the rub rail uh, position. Uh, the reason we don't go every screw is because if you start to follow either the top edge of the cap or the, or the, the body line on the hull itself, uh, you'll find that most boats, they don't match perfectly all the way around. So we do it this way and then you can go back and eyeball it and you can follow a nice fluid area and then we'll fill in the middles of those with screws and then you're pretty much set. You can go ahead and fill in all the rest of the holes after that. Uh, the biggest problem was the insert is, is uh, it's an excellent insert, but it's extremely stiff. Uh, we found the best way to put that in was to do sections at a time. We went ahead and we laid out, uh, you know, 15 or 20 feet of it so, or so, and I clipped it to the, to the rub rail with some spring clips. And then I would heat about 10, 12 inches at a time just to soften it enough where I could go ahead and, and make it pliable where I could just push it in with a putty knife. But everything went in very well. And, and actually, it is an excellent rub rail. It, the, the insert actually sticks out almost three quarters of an inch, which the insert is going to take almost all of the abuse, which is uh, a whole lot less expensive than changing the entire rub rail. We're, we're trying to meet this deadline, but um, certain things are kind of pushing it further and further away. So uh, we're going to keep going and see what we can get done. When we come back, LNH Boats works on restoring and customizing one of their own at LNH 33. This segment brought to you by Suzuki Marine, the ultimate outboard motor. to Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat. Join the crew at LNH Boats as they bring an LNH 33 back to life. The project we're going to start with today is the uh, LNH 33. It's an older 1995, built back in the beginning, early days of the company, hull number five, and one of the only boats that we let go out of the shop partially complete. Uh, the owner did some fiberglass fabrication of his own. The boat really came out very nice. Um, jump ahead 20 something years, uh, the boat goes on the market. A gentleman from uh, Ocean City, Maryland, uh, Jake Robinson, ends up buying it, calls us up, asks us if we're interested in uh, doing a redo on the boat, uh, bringing it back in and seeing what needs to be done on it. And, and it certainly did show its age. So we joined up with Jake and uh, brought the project into the shop to begin it. So we removed everything. The paintwork in the engine room needed to be redone. The paintwork in the cabin needed to be redone. The paintwork on the outside of the boat obviously needed to be redone. One of the jobs I do, aside from doing fiberglass fabrication, is paintwork as well. And when we got to the end of that boat, most of the paintwork had been done, but the, the uh, finishing touches and the non-skid, which is the last part of the paint process on the boat, hadn't been finished yet. So and we stepped in, l &H stepped in, and finished that project up so that we could keep the ball moving and start getting into the uh, rigging and, and wiring stage on the boat. Jake wanted to put some teak on the boat, 
and he, he has seen some of our later boats where we're doing a, the faux teak finish on a lot of the control pods, teak transoms. Everything that you see done in a high gloss teak finish can now be done in, in what's described and called faux teak finish. We got hooked up with Monique. Uh, she works out of merit, comes very highly recommended. Before Monique arrives on site, uh, we paint a base coat down on the part that, to be faux teak. It's a custom color that she has mixed up that is the base coat for this faux teak operation. She's an artist and, it, and it's really something to see it done. I'm Monique Richter and I work for a bunch of different boat builders and I basically mimic teak wood but with all grip paints. So I produce a product that lasts for about 10 years and you don't have to do any kind of maintenance and it looks just like teak. I started doing artwork when I was about three years old. So I've always done fine art. And I recently have been seeing uh, boats that have painted transoms and I just felt there's a need to fine tune them, make them a little different so they looked like realistic teak. And I do all the painted names too. So all the gold leaf I do by hand and platinum leaf I do by hand. And it's an old trade that's, it's a dying trade that I learned from old timers that master gold leafers who taught me the trade. I have um, multiple assistants that work for me. I'm the only artist that works for the company. They assist me with all the equipment, get the whole job sites ready, and they're amazing. With the paint, you could really make it exactly how you want it. You don't have to worry about a bad piece of grain or two different colors of teak boards coming together. Everything is the same tone and it lasts, it's durable. You know, you don't have pieces of uh, boards that are getting warped or, or buckling. It's all grit paint, so I mean, it lasts for 10 years. You know, it's just like a regular white paint job, but it's just brown colors. Every piece I do is for the builders. Um, L and H, they got a nice flair to them in the bow, and I'm gonna have a nice, like, flare to their helm pod with a grain, you know, and just kind of make it their own. So they look different than another boat builder I'm doing. And then it's more artwork, you know, everyone has their own piece. Like I sign a little M in, in all of my teak grains. So it's kind of like a one of a kind, and it's more art than just a faux paint. To do faux teak versus to just maintain the wood every three years is the same cost and you don't have to do more maintenance. You just leave it alone and you just enjoy your boat. You don't gotta worry about the bright work. Uh, we come back in with the clear coat. So the first coat's done, um, no touch. We, we just spray on top of her work and, and spray a light coat of clear on it. Put on eight, 10 coats of clear coat on top of that and uh, preserve her, her perfect uh, piece of artwork. Next week on Florida Sportsman Project Dreamboat, LNH Boats works to complete the 33 on time for delivery day. The experts at Two Rivers Boat Works continue rigging on the 36 foot yellow fin. George Labonte joins dreamboat owner Rick Cerrito aboard his fully restored 1978 Formula 233. And Stewart Boat Works starts the build of a very custom 27.